Chapter 5, David Davidson As soon as they landed, although it was late at night, I made a call to Murad to relieve him that I wasn't deported and that it was just a show. Murad and I laughed at our silliness and he told me that he felt that that would turn out to be the case. What did they, tu- what did they do to you? I asked. Unlike Murad, I did not underestimate the um, authority of the police and was not as confident as Murad was to stand was to stand up against him. There was a point that I was very much afraid that Murat would be in jail for me, but Murat knew his rights under undeterred and knew that he had, hadn't broken the law by just keeping a long-distance relationship with me, even if I was a minor. Whether it was apparent that Murat and I developed a strong sentimental tie or not, they couldn't arrest him just based on his feelings for me. He further told me that they were diligently looking for a reason to arrest him. They checked his laptop to see if he had child pornography and interrogated him with a per- preponderance of probing questions at which point nothing was found at, and all they could do was simply detain him. Murat was a computer programmer by profession and he carried his laptop everywhere he went. That is how they had the opportunity to have a sneak peek into his digital possessions. We concluded the conversation as he told me the most amazing compliment I've ever seen received that i was like a beautiful blooming flower that was uh, that was worth fighting for now when i think of that moment i realized that had rita allowed us to maintain a relationship really marat would have still been in touch with her very very awkwardly and senselessly Rita tried to contact Marat even after all the circus as if nothing had happened, without even slightly acknowledging her wrongdoing towards him. Marat to this day doesn't contact her, and how in the world can you blame him? Rita had a chance to prove herself to be different, but she messed it up, and how, and how she sits, yearns, and expects him to continue being in contact with her without reflecting on her wrongdoing towards Marat, the logic very much escapes me. When uh, Rita is wronged by someone, she very well remembers it. But when she does the wrongdoing, she doesn't even consider it to be so. The next day, I knew that I had to go register for school and there was no time to waste. I was living in a senior house with grandma and because it was a minor, the management did not bother us. Very closely and con- very close and conveniently to the location where I lived, there was a high school called Spring Valley High School. My aunt did not approve that I was going to go to a public school, but this time she had no say in the matter. I entered the high school and told the administration that I needed to register for school, and they told me where to go, explaining that I needed a legal guardian with me to follow through with the process and that I had to bring a legal ID with me. Although grandma didn't speak English and I was doing all the details, um, I took grandma with me and we went to the site where I was able to register for school, which was miles away from the school itself. I entered the place, went through the procedure and showed them my Israeli passport, which was the only legal document that I had at the time. Thankfully, even though I was undocumented, I had the right for education. Through the process of registering myself for school, I realized how independent and reliant on myself I had to be, even though I was very young, only 14, which felt as if I was my own true guardian. Through the school, I was also able to get into a medical health insurance program. Shortly after, I met with my school counselor, Mrs. Harvey, um, who was the most dedicated and considered counselor I've ever had. She looked at my transcript and was utterly impressed with my eighth grade transcript where I had eight subjects and in every subject I I produced a solid A. Girl, girl, would you like to consider taking honors classes? She asked me in a matter-of-fact way. Very much, I do, I replied confidently. The only subject that I couldn't take as, on, as an honors class was math, because in New York, they teach algebra and geometry together. In California, they teach first algebra in one year and geometry in another year, which makes a lot more sense to me. The problem is that I found out that even though the honors class was not a breeze, 
what made it mostly honors was that it considered of uh, consisted of students who were eager to learn. The classes that were not honors consisted of troublemakers who just wanted to pass the minimal requirement and move on with their lives. Math class during my freshman year of high school was a struggle, not in terms of its material, but in terms of the kind of students I was subjected to. Mr. Wiseman was such an excellent teacher because he implemented control when certain students would display an attitude. But when he was absent and there was a substitute, the class was a total nightmarish mayhem. Uh, one day, Mr. Wiseman was called to jury duty and I thought that I should not go to school. I prayed that he would not be accepted and the next day he was at school for which I, uh, for which I asked him what happened. He said the jury duty selection turned him down. I was so ecstatic about that. The only thing that propelled me forward was my obsessive preoccupation in school, as well as extracurricular activities, but the pressure that I had to endure aside from that was grandma terrorizing and provoking me on a regular basis. Grandma always likes to gain a sense of sovereignty over somebody, which is an act that dad calls vampirism, as she seemingly tries to suck out a person's energy. We constantly had conflicts. The more she tried to control me, the more I resisted into contradiction and escaped the conflict by delving deeper into my studies. School allowed me to forget my problems. At times, she wouldn't allow me to talk to my dad, of which my resistance grew into all kinds of series of altercations. There was one very memorable incident when Grandma was no longer friends with a blind lady named Ro Rosa. Grandma expected me to side with her and also unfriend Rosa, but that's not how I act according to my con consideration. Her fights with Rosa had nothing to do with me, and if she was not friends with her, it didn't mean I wouldn't be either. Grandma was berating me one day about visiting Rosa, getting really close to my personal bubble. I asked her to maintain her distance, but she continued to scream in front of my face and I impulsively pushed her, at which point I underestimated my power because she fell into the wall and dented it. When you are angry or feeling protective, your powers rise to unbelievable measures. We plastered the wall and I told every uh, and I told every conflict and problem that I had with Grandma to Murad, and he called the Child Protective Service. A guy named Demetrius investigated my case, but Grandma put on a cute face and the case was unfounded and closed. While doing my world history homework, I was studying the three religions. I, re uh, I read the Jewish religion and there was nothing new to me. I read about Islam, Muhammad and its nonsense and continued with a series of dismissiveness. Then I read Christianity, into which doctrines I was captivated and read with much interest. When I read about Jesus instructing his people to turn the other cheek, I remembered how I did just that when my aunt was choking me and I interlaced my hands in the back of me literally exposing my other cheek to her. I also read his excerpt from the history textbook. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor as and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Matthew five forty three forty eight. I remember that in my elementary school in Israel, we were drilled with the, with that precept: "Ve'afta l'ra'acha kamocha, love thy neighbor as thy neighbors as thy as yourself." But the concept of loving your enemies that are in fact your neighbors was foreign to me. Jesus' explanation that the act of excluding your love to only your people is not glorifying is not a glorifying act to God appeared very foreign to me. But the rational strangely made sense to me. Why is Jesus making so much sense? I thought as I was immersed in the textbook. But because I couldn't answer it, I put it in the back of my mind and moved on. To reiterate, though, Judaism could be both perceived as a genealogical identity of a sect of people or a form of belief systems that are manifested through works to get to God. Islam is also a religion that is made up by men just like 
the Jewish religion, but Christianity as a whole is not a religion. It is the fact, it is like the birth certificate of, of the world to which we have to place our faith. Although men try to twist its doctrines into a religion during Paul the Apostle's name, the Apostle's time, Christianity was called the way. It was later renamed to be Christianity simply to say that those that call themselves Christians follow Christ's divine truth. Finally, midterms came around and I was studying one day for my math exam as I was lying prostrate on the ground with my book in front of me. In comes grandma, in comes my grandma who saw my sandals thrown around and she asked me to put my sandals away. I said that I would as soon as I was done with the particular math exercise. But grandma raised her voice in the manner that it should be done immediately. When she started to scream and no longer validated her need and in a contradictory manner continued to work and ignore her. Then she approached habitually very close to my face and started screaming in my ear that I should put my sandals away. And I more forcefully tried to concentrate on my textbook and, in spite, continued to pretend to ignore her. Only that this time, it was very much more challenging to concentrate. Then she attempted to confiscate my textbook, and I instinctively huddled it over my core in a position of recalling porcupine. My grandma decided to get on top of my back, which made it harder to hold her. So I spread myself prostrate across the floor to distribute my surface area to hold her weight. She asked that I would put my sandals away again, and I said that I would not, just because I understood that if I did, I would legitimize her commanding tactics. If she respected me, she would have given me the time to do it, and I would have done it. But because she went to this roundabout and vindictive way, I purposefully refused to do it, even if the request was minor, because I didn't want to encourage her wicked ways of discipline. We stayed in that position for 50 minutes. I tracked the time. In those 50 minutes, she started riding me like a horse, bouncing up and down to the point that I decided to scream at the top of my lungs in hopes that the neighbors would hear, and she finally got off of my back. The sandals were still not put away. My back was extremely sore for two days, and Grandma didn't see anything wrong with it. To give her credit, I was spoiled in the fact that she did all the household whole chores for me, cooked, and was deprived of and was deprived of the TB because I did homework all day long in the living room. Grandma and I were living in a one-bedroom apartment, living room, and a kitchen. I slept in the living room and Grandma in the bathroom. In the bedroom. I told Murad about this incident and he told me to write to Mr. Seguir because she was a mandated reporter since he knew that I kept in touch with Ms. Seguir. I did, and Mr. Seguir wrote a report to Child Protective Services. Peter Dolan started investigating the case. He connected me to a very incompetent therapist who sided with my grandma and himself didn't believe me. No social worker believed that such a cute and caring grandma was capable of such a deed or many other deeds. He didn't want to take me away from my grandma because he believed that grandma doted on me and the case was again unfounded. While living with grandma, I befriended an elderly man named Mo Mordechai who was Moshe's blood uncle. Mord uh, Mordechai was a lot less religious and was more modernized Jewish Orthodox, but sometimes he exposed me to his filthy mind. One time he asked me if I ever masturbated because it was so much on familiar terms with Mordechai. The topic did not discomfort me, but rather made me curious. When I told him I had never done that, he was surprised. Everyone masturbates. You should explore Explore your body sometime. Because it was young and somewhat impressionable, I decided to try it with a small stuffed animal, which after the, uh, after the act, it was soaked with my bodily fluid. Then I thought that it was just stupid, and I forgetfully flung the stuffed animal somewhere away. The most shameful thing that has ever happened to me was still to come. Menachem, my older cousin, had a small baby, and he brought her over to our apartment a day after my experimental exploration. The little girl spotted that stuffed animal 
and started playing with it and worse putting it into her mouth. As I looked at the scenery, I was utterly repulsed by my own self. I wanted to snatch that stuffed animal away from her, but it wouldn't look appropriate to do such a thing to a child. My heart was pumping the vessels of the ultimate sense of guilt, and I impatiently waited until she would find another entertainment. When she finally... When she finally let go of that toy, I took it, got out of the apartment, and threw it into the dumpsters. Then I came home, and to distract myself from my overwhelming guilt, I found her a green stuffed animal completely fresh and untouched and played with her. But I never quite forgot that extreme sense of self-repulsion that I experienced that day. The reason why I'm sharing this experience is to be able to share my view on the topic of masturbation, which is like the big unspoken elephant in the room. I'm quite convinced that many are guilty of it, but I believe that masturbation is a source of hedonistic self-pleasure that originates from unsavory, selfish reasons. Furthermore, I believe that any act that is not served to glorify God and is self-absorbed is not pleasing in God's eyes, and masturbation is one of those acts. But at some point in my life, I started to question why human beings always fall into the self-wishing, self-pleasing entrapment. During the fall semester of 2014, I took an English class called American Literature at the College of San Mateo, where we analyzed and dug into deeper understandings of American-based literature. I stumbled across an American poet, Walt Whitman, who wrote a 1,300-line poem called Song of Myself, where he addressed the topic of or, uh, onanism in very metaphoric and vivid details, which brought me to a stage of self-reflection on that incident that I have just described. My first act of it and its consequence. This time, instead of bashing myself and feeling shameful, I tried to think deeper into it to understand why humanity uniformly finds an escaping an intrinsic sense of pleasure in that act, even though I know within myself that it is an unwholesome preoccupation. In other words, I wanted to come into a sort of understanding of how the physicality of the experience affects the mind. During the class hour, we had to choose a topic that Walt Whitman addressed in the poem, Song of Myself, and write an in-class analysis of it. I chose to analyze the topic of masturbation. We were given 25 minutes to write, to which I took only five minutes, jotting down a small paragraph for which I got the full credit. This is what I wrote. As far as my notions stretched to the subject of masturbation, upon touching myself in the most sensitive area of our body that easily reacts through ways of contact. One finds pleasure in the fact that you are confirmed of your physical existence through the sense of touch, as it is comforting to feel the functions of the rushing of one's blood. The area upon contact feels like it is the center of your being, to which you get the opportunity to develop a heightened sense of self-awareness, and that is what I think is appealing about it. This feeling is quite analogous to meditation techniques that make someone feel more grounded by simply concentrating on one's rhythmic breathing, only that masturbation involves more of the engagement of physical sensations. As we live our day-to-day -day lives, we become desensitized from our own sense of self as we are mentally drowned in the corners of the abstractions of our mind that are full of tempestuous waves of thought, causing us to feel devoid of substance and full of hollowness in one's state of being. Therefore, feeling your own tangibility brings forth feelings of ecstasy and euphoria, which comes out to the whole theme of the self and dedication to the self. However, the reason why I divulge all these details is not to develop some kind of excuse to that addictive behavior, but to lead you towards an understanding that the urge to masturbate or even to, to egotistical, obsessive, self-absorbed think thinking subsides and dissipates through the process of ingraining your spiritual existence upon the statutes of God. The more your thoughts are altruistic and focused on God, the more righteous self-awareness you will develop, where there will be significantly less abstractions of the mind, and where you fe will feel your consciousness standing upon the ground, instead of hovering upon the gray area of life to the point that you will have a desire to depend on unwholesome, selfish, physical ways of grounding.
The process of ingraining your spiritual existence upon the statutes of God is manifested by constant, consistently maintaining a relationship with God. Why do we develop a more spiritual and fulfilling state of self-awareness through our continual relationship with God? Because it is what truly defines us defines us god is unfathomably multi multi multi-dimensional and multifaceted and each of us upholds its unique qualities as we are made in his image we develop an intrinsically higher understanding of our ways of existence and ourselves through a committed relationship with him the subject will further be elaborated and strongly dri drilled in my sequel one major highlight of my freshman year of high school was the extracurricular activities that i was involved in one was the sci a science olympiad club which is a preparatory club that teaches participants different science subjects in the end we got a, to compete with other schools to measure the level of our knowledge in respect to other schools by taking exams. Whichever high school earns more points wins the exp uh, competition. I was involved in a very laborious project where you get to construct a sort of wooden structure that was used to hold a bucket of 15 kilos of sand, of, sand, of which intention was what it, of the, was that it would endure its pressure without snapping. The lighter the structure would be, the better the chances we had to win the contest, only that the higher the chances were that it would snap. Nevertheless, the structure had to be built in concordance of the law laws of physics so that the pressure of the 15 kilos of sand would be well, well distributed as the structure was to hold that bucket. I was involved in the project with a partner in 10th grade named Vieira, Vieira and another guy whose name was Michael, who was an amazing moral support through the process and frustrations of building it. If Michael could, he would have also helped build it, uh, but unfortunately he was quadriplegic, which is a condition where both your hands and legs are paralyzed. He became paralyzed from a mindless diving accident, but I became friends with him. On top of that, Michael was an amazing asset to the Science Olympiad team because his mind was extremely bright. Vieira and I put a lot of effort and heart into building the intricacies of that structure, where each part required its precision and meticulousness. The structure turned out to be complex and beautiful, and I just fell in love with it. Vieira and I agreed that we would call it Titan, but unfortunately, Mr. Stilwell, the chemistry teacher that led the particulars of the club, said that we should test Titan's aptitude before the day of the Science Olympiad competition. I was very hesitant about that because I was afraid that it would break. Mr. Stilwell insisted and asked us to build a backup if Titan were to fail on its mission. Vieira and I built a simpler version of the tower and Vieira decided that we should call it Majestic. When we tested Titan, Titan worked. It held the entire weight, of which fact I was very much relieved. I developed some kind of a loathing for, Maj for Majestic because of the idea of it replacing Titan. Titan and Majestic were considered to be brothers by us builders, as I was considered the paternal aggressive par parent creator and Vieira the soft-hearted maternal creator. Titan weighed 20, tw 22 grams and Majestic weighed 56 grams. Despite the gloriousness of Titan, Vieira favored Majestic over Titan. Titan weighed 22 grams that had to hold 15 kilos. There are 1,000 grams in one kilo. 15 kilos is equivalent to 15,000 grams, and Titan weighed only 22 grams, which gives you an understanding of what Titan was up against. The trick was that Titan had to be constructed in such a way that we hoped would fulfill its mission. But it's like a feather holding an elephant, and that fact was what was fascinating about the project. We brought both Titan and Majestic to the event. Titan had to display its workability as it was connected to some sort of ap apparition where the bucket was clasped to it, dangling downwards. Vieira cautiously filled the bucket with sand as I maintained the steadiness of the bucket. 
at which point I abstained from even breathing. The tower unexpectedly snapped into two at a weight of 14.7 kilos, despite the fact that it worked at our home school. Only 300 grams was left to it and it did not survive. I was so disheartened by that. Just for fun, we decided to test Majestic where Vieira and I switched position. This time, I filled the bucket and Vieira was holding it steady. I experienced so much hatred towards Majestic and a sense of loss of Titan that I filled the bucket somewhat recklessly and aggressively with sharp and edgy motions. I wanted to snap, but I finished filling all the sand into the bucket. Majestic was very tense, but it still managed to hold the bucket. After the very moment of filling the last grain of sand, the crowd counted to five to see if it would snap. Majestic was so tight that it seemed that it would snap any moment. As the, as the crowd was counting till five, Vieira and I, because of our close proximity and the apparent potential brittleness of Majestic, close, closed our eyes as if we were in the seated position on our knees, covering our heads. After the count, impressively, despite my desire of it to break down it still held the bucket as it was in great pressure in a great pressure i was amazed our high school got the third bronze medal in that category for titan's achievements and i was very proud but still in mourning for titan in retrospect analysis because i believe that god teaches his wisdom not only through the bible but through our own experience since everything that uh, concerns the nature of the world is governed by him I tried to make sense of what God was teaching me through this experience, and this is what I arrived to understand. Vieira and I were like Rebecca and Isaac in the Bible, respectively. I was Isaac who wanted to give Titan, my Esau, my blessings to thrive, while Vieira favored Majestic, the simpler, younger version of Titan, who wanted to give Majestic her Jacob the blessings. The unexpected fact is that Majestic followed through with the completion of its intended job, while Titan did not. On top of that, I understood that the effort that counts in God's kingdom is not the effort that counts in the worldly kingdom. Majestic's durability and survival did not count in the competition. It was Titan that counted. But the important thing to understand is that Majestic was a simpler, less complex structure, which is a symbol of God's easy yoke that is used to help us survive the worldly, intense pressure of which simplicity and effect does not count in the world, but counts in God's kingdom. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty nine thirty. I consider Majestic to be the easy yoke because we built it in a day while we built Titan over the duration of several months as the first structure was simple and the latter was complex, respectively. Titan is the yoke that we put on as we pr uh, pursue the dreams of our lives aside from God and Majestic is the yoke that we put on as we walk through our lives with God. What sustains the pressure and brings us to victory is God's yoke, Majestic's yoke. What snaps in two is the yoke that is created aside from God, our selfish, not God-oriented ambitions, I mean. Even though we are deceived by the appearance of beauty, bogged down by the complexity and the gloriousness of our efforts in life aside from God, like Titan was, it does not follow through to sustain the pressure of it, because one day it would snap. Well, the simple yoke of simplicity and steadfast obedience to God is what truly sustains us to survive the pressure of life in victorious ways without snapping, which is what majestic is the symbolism of. This wisdom is apl applicable in later experiences of life. The second very famous extracurricular that I was involved in is the Multicultural Club. During my freshman year of high school, I dressed one day as a Ukrainian with a flower crown and mentioned earlier, um, a flowy skirt and a traditional shirt. Grandma helped me come up with the costume. I looked so deeply feminine and delicate. I danced in front of the entire high school to Russian, uh, to Russian pop music. On top of that, I sang a Russian song called Katyusha, which they used to sing during World War II after beating the Nazis as the soldiers marched forward 
in the parade and the tanks behind them. It's a song about how a girl, Katusha, waits in loyal anticipation for her beloved one to come home from the war safe and sound. The only engaging addition that I made to the song is that in every two lines, the crowd gets to say, Hey! Although the crowd didn't know a word I was singing, I caught their attention on the Hey! You can listen to the actual lyrics of Katusha on YouTube. Although I had very few friends, I managed to develop one meaningful friendship with an African-American girl named Keisha. She was in my English honors class, and we had a lunch period together. In Spring Valley High School, each student has their own individual lunch period, and I happened to have it with Keisha. As the year progressed, she had a very very abusive parents, especially her father, who was a corrupt police officer. Keisha was hanging out with a senior boy, and her father did not approve. He took away her lunch money, but thankfully we had each other, and I shared with her my food. Despite the abuse, Keisha performed to her best potential school-wise. Eventually, the abuse became worse. Her father cut all of her beautiful dreadlocks, and she was forced to wear the same outfit for weeks. Keisha complained to me, but was still full of spirit and hope. I couldn't see her in that state, and I strongly urged her that she should talk to a counselor about that, what she was going through, and she did. They took her to a shelter called Homeless and Runaway Youth Shelter that was run by Project Turning Point. They took care of her there. Every time I went to class, Keisha would come running towards me full of gaiety and adoration despite the fact that she was overwhelmed with instability. I kept in touch with her even when they moved her to Virginia to live with her biological mom. She used to live with her stepmother when she was with her biological father in New York. However, they changed her number and I lo no longer could contact her since. All I can do from that point on is pray for her. Aside from that, I was very much excelling in school, and my English teacher, Mrs. Rosie, sometimes within the school year, urged me and Keisha to participate in an Oprah Winfrey writing contest by reading a book called Night, written by Ellie Bezo. Keisha and I were the strongest students in the class, and Miss Rosie believed in us. She gave us the prompt and the dead uh, and the deadline to work on top of our regular coursework. At the time, I had no computer. I was typing all of my schoolwork at the library, and thankfully, people that had to use Microsoft Word were not timed. First of all, the book is an autobiography of a Holocaust survivor who was the author of which account was supremely vivid and illustratively horrifying. It made me feel as though I was going through the experience itself and I so wanted to stop breathing. But because I wanted to find out how Ellie survived it, I couldn't let go of the book until I finished it. Once I finished reading it in its entirety, entirety traditionally every time I had an essay to write, I would first write it in a notebook and then I would go to Finkelstein Memorial Library, which practically became my second home, to finalize the content by typing it and I would edit it as I went. As I was typing at one of the computers in the library, there was a fellow with a freshly cut ha hairstyle who was sitting in a computer right next to me and strangely entrenched into the computer screen. I looked over his shoulder and was curious to know what he was writing, and it looked like he was writing poems. I struck up a sporadic conversation with him, and he revealed to me that his name was David Davidson and that he used to be Hasidic, but he was tired of his father ordering him around. He abandoned the entire religion, along with his wife and his three kids. He showed me his ID, and he looked starkly different than what I saw in front of me. I couldn't recognize him at all. His beard was completely shaven and his side hair completely cut. I asked him how old he was and he told me that he was 26, that he was trying to become a police officer and he took on the hobby of writing poems. 
He explained to me that in order to become a police officer, you had to go through an intensive sort of physical training and some law enforcement tests. I looked at him and quite doubted that he could do it because he wasn't very scary or authoritative looking as one would think a policeman should be. On top of that, he had an awkward stride. Then he started asking about my life and I told him my life story in a nutshell. He was so inspired by it that he asked me, if I would permit him to write a poem about me. I was curious to read his other poems, which he let, which he let me, and I saw that although he was a very bad speller, the composition of the words that he used re uh, relayed his very own sense of gentility and charm. I agreed for him to write a poem, and this is what he came up with through our short conversation. I feel so bad for you, I must say. I see that you are hurt all the way. You were thrown around like a ball. Nobody is hearing your crying and your call. You are so intelligent and so smart. You are like a piece of art. I see that you have a lot of strength in you. Keep yourself strong. That is the thing you should do. I feel your suffering and your pain. You are thrown around like a chain. There will be good times for you. Make a lot of friends. That's what you should do. My heart is for you bleeding. My heart is for you beating. Don't worry, you are not alone. You are not only scowl and bone. You are a special human being. That's what I'm seeing. Things will work out, I have no doubt. I look in your eyes, I see golden flies. I feel for you so much. I will be here for you as a crutch. You should know that I am always there. That is the thing that is only fair. You have beautiful hair, I will always care. You have a beautiful face, I will put my heart for you in a case. Feel special and feel great. You are wonderful, there is no debate. Life will still be beautiful for you. Make some friends that should be the thing you should do. You have a lot of inspiration. I feel towards you a wonderful sensation. To Alina from David Davidson, your closest friend. That was the most precious gift that a person could have ever given to me, a piece of his soul. That poem has been preserved through the years, through my continuous migrations and instabilities, and it allows me to see myself and my true worth in the eyes of another from the very first impression, which I believe is not erroneous. That year I was in an art class where I got to make a reflection painting, and it turned out to be very much a reflection of my persona, colorful, dynamic, with three words that completely describe me, dreamy, adventurous, and loyal. At the end of the year, the teacher really liked my work, and she gave me oil tubes for free that are very expensive.